following program sponsored by Adams Financial Concepts. About Money, a different approach to investing you won't hear anywhere else. Your host, Mike Adams, is a registered investment advisor and works with investment portfolios exceeding over $100,000 in net worth and has a proven track record of managing long-term investments surpassing the markets in the long term. The information shared on the following program is for educational purposes only, and any investment advice given may not be suitable for all investors. And now, here's Mike. It's Friday afternoon, and we're going to be talking about money. You know, over the past five years, I've been talking about two themes, three themes, talking ab about what I felt was going to happen. You know, being a financial advisor, I'm really in part in the, the forecasting business. I analyze companies. I analyze their 10Ks, their 10Qs. I look at their products. I look at their management. I do all those things. But in the end, it comes down to forecasting. And forecasting is, is one of those things you never are certain that you're going to get to where you think you're going to go. And in fact, if you look at my portfolios, you'll find that I'm wrong a number of times. It's, it's about looking forward and trying to look forward and evaluating how we do. I go to a lot of conferences every year. And those conferences, a lot of times you have a speaker who will get up and come up with an analysis of the market or an analysis of where things are going. They can be completely dead wrong. The next year you show up and they've got their, their analysis for the year. Nobody remembers what they said from the previous year. I always find that burdensome and troubling. But today I want to go back and repeat a theme that I've been talking about for a number of years. It's a long-term theme. I think there's a, a long-term thing going on in the markets and in the world and with GDP. I've been talking about it for five years. I I'm going to be talking about it probably for another 5 to 15 years. I don't know when it's going to come to an end. I think I have some ideas of how it's going to come to an end, and I've shared those on the program. But I believe that the theme is, is valid. And as we're going through a short-term disruption in this, this theme, the question is always, am I wrong in what's going on? I don't think so. I believe that I'm still right. I'm going to talk about the theme. And then in the end of the program, I'm going to talk about evaluation and evaluating who thinks and who forecasts and who forecasts correctly. That's coming up. But before I get there, and I do have a guest, very, very key guest. You're going to want to hear what he has to say. That's coming in the program. But before I get there, I want to mention today that there isn't a company in earshot that hasn't or that isn't swimming in a ton of data. You have CRM data, you have uh, HR data, you have ERP data, you have marketing data, you have financial data, you have proprietary system data. There isn't a there's data that's purchased, there's data that you've you've created yourself. That all is data, and you're swimming in data. But, you know, are you really getting the value you expect out of that data? Are you really getting enough analysis out of what you're seeing? Brainbox Consultant was on the program, and they are a company that analyzes data and puts it into a form which makes it easy for you to analyze and put it all together and make it reasonable. And they have offered, because they were on the program, and that for the next two months, they have offered that they will give you a free consulting if you want to contact them. They'll talk about your data. They'll talk about what they can do with your data. So take, take the opportunity log on to their website, www.teambrainbox.com. Check them out. See what they are. See what they can do with your data. Makes sense. <clears throat> that was an unpaid advertisement. 
that was just because they were on the program and they wanted to offer that. So we'll see where that goes. Standard Chartered Bank of the UK did a study in 2008, 2009, looking at world GDP, world gro gro domestic gross product, looking at that data. And they found that there were certain times when the world GDP grew faster for a sustained period of time than the average. And they looked at that and they called that a super cycle. Became a very important paper as people looked at what was happening coming out of the Great Recession in 2008, 2009. People looked at this, this study and saw the validity of what was there. The first super cycle was a long super cycle that lasted from 1870 to 1913. Now, I've talked about the super cycle a number of times, but I think it's important to review and revisit it every three or four or five months because it is such a long-term thing that it's easy to forget about. It's easy to file it away. If I talked about it four years ago and that was it, it's easily forgotten. And I believe that most investment people have forgotten about it. They got really excited about it a few years ago, but as we came into this tumultuous period we're going through now, they've forgotten about it. Now, in that first super cycle, it lasted 43 years, and that super cycle was driven primarily by the industrialization of the United States, 1870 to 1913. Think about the things that happened. The Model T, the assembly line. You had the railroads that happened. You had telephone and telegraph that were developed. You had the steam engine and internal combustion engines. You had steel and aluminum, which began to come to the market and be used widely, used widely used. You had electricity develop. You had clean water. Clean water may have been one of the greatest achievements of that period of time. You had a powerful growth, difficult business cycles, but powerful growth. If you look at what happened in the United States in 1874, we went through a financial crisis just like we did in 2008, 2009. Unlike 2008, 2009, where the bank, the banks were rescued by the government, where the Fed came in and pumped money into the banks, where the Treasury pumped money into the banks. Unlike that, in 1874, the arguments were the same as we heard from some of the opposition to bailing out the banks. Some of the same things we're hearing at the debates, don't bail out the banks. In 1874, that did not happen. The result of that was that crisis lasted for almost 30 years. Imagine that, 30 years of what was 2008, 2009 like. That's what happened when they didn't bail out the banks. In some ways, it was fortunate because it led to the industrialization of the United States, which led to a worldwide growth in GDP. But it was damaging. You know, if you looked at the situation in 1874, and as we went into that, into the 1870s, the 1860s, the large majority, over 75% of wealth was along the Mississippi, and it was all related to cotton. So over 75% of the millionaires were not in New York City. They were along the Mississippi River, and those millionaires were growing cotton. At that beginning of the time, as we went into that crisis in 1874 that was to last for 30 years, and every other year was a recessionary kind of year, as we went into that, unemployment we didn't keep track of, but it was probably close to 20% during much of that time. But those people who were unemployed, they moved into the cities and they began to create businesses, businesses which were industrial businesses, no longer related to, no longer related to agriculture. And from being an agricultural nation, the United States became an industrial United nation. And the United States began to emerge as a world leader. On the debate, somebody said we were a world leader by 1870. Not true. London 
was the world's financial center, and it continued to be through most of that time. It wouldn't be until the early 20th century that the United States would really be recognized as the leader of the world. The second cycle, 1945 to 1970, a 35-year period, time period, driven by primarily by the reconstruction of Europe and by Asian exports. It was a relatively benign period for business cycles. We didn't go through the same thing as we went through 1874 to 1913. We went through a relatively benign period of time, but it was a, a growth in wealth countries like the US and the UK and France and Germany. The stock market went from 150 to 1,000 during that period of time. The colonial system died. The Cold War, a competition between the US and the USSR over former colonial nations went through that whole entire period. But it was a, a time when you think about what happened. The consumer grew. We saw fast food. We saw TV. We saw two-car families. We saw the 40-hour work week come into, into being vacations. Housing was built, the GI Bill, education, the infrastructure across the country, the highways, the airports, and computerization. That was typical of that time. Now we're going to come back and talk about the new cycle. The new cycle, which began in 2009, so don't go away. And if you miss some of these programs, you can find them on Adam's Financial Concepts. Don't go away. We're coming to a break, and I want to come back to the, the third cycle. About Money with Mike Adams will resume in a moment on Business Radio 1300 KKOL. For more information, Money. click on AdamsFinancialConcepts.com. Lots of people manage investment portfolios. Just a few can manage a successful portfolio and provide exceedingly great service to their clients. Here's Mike Adams from Adams Financial Concepts. We believe the price you pay should be based on the performance of your portfolio and the quality of service you receive. You know, Mike, it seems that a lot of companies subscribe to the one-size-fits-all mentality of investing. Does one size really fit all? Not with us. Every portfolio that we manage is customized to fit each particular client's objectives and risk tolerance. We place our clients' interests first in all portfolio decisions. If you're looking for a home for your seven-figure-plus investment portfolio, call Mike Adams of Adams Financial Concepts, specializing in creating and maintaining wealth for over 20 years. 206-903-1019. That's 206-903-1019. Or log on to adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Now we return to About Money. There's more information waiting for you at adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Here again is your host, Mike Adams. And talking about who you'll never never know who you'll meet at Barnes & Noble, you'll never know who you're going to hear from on this radio program about money. And I have a great guest coming up. But I want to pick up where I would talk was talking about. I was talking about the super cycles. The first super cycle from 1870 to 1913, driven primarily by the industrialization of the U.S. The second super cycle from 1945 to 1970, driven primarily by the rebuilding of Europe and Asian exports. The new cycle, according to Standard Charter, began in 2009, just when we were bottoming out. The Great Recession was coming to a bottom and starting to come out. And it the new super cycle is going to be driven primarily by the emerging nations, especially the Asian nations. You know, the forecast is that by 2030, not that far away, 15 years away, 14, that 93% of the world's middle class will live in those emerging nations. Think about that. 93% of the world's middle class. Think about the world's middle, or the, the middle class in China. It exceeds almost, or it's approaching 400 million people. That's bigger than the entire population of the US. You have China, you have India, you have those countries where they are accumulating middle wealth. You know, the winners of this new super cycle are gonna be global countries. 
China and India, Brazil, Indonesia, Russia, Turkey, Sub-Sahara Africa, those countries are all going to participate. Now, there, there was a, th- a study done by a guy at Goldman talking about the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. You know, the study that was done is not valid. And that's, I'm going to talk about that later in the program, why that wasn't valid, why it was poor work. But anyway, it's become something that people <clears throat> took hold of, they hooked into, and it seemed reasonable and logical. Sadly, it wasn't supported by real data, or the data was very minimal. But we're going to talk about that later in the program. I'll come back to that. But those are countries that will benefit. But there's going to be big risk. There's going to be political and social volatility. And we've seen that now with what's happened in Russia. We're seeing that in Brazil. We're seeing some of that happen in China and India as well. The countries are very much less transparent than they are in the U.S. They're less stable. An investment can be more vulnerable. It's going to be subject to the politicians and the bureaucracies. And corruption can be epidemic. It's a fundamental shift in the balance of power. If you look right now at what controls trade, the U.S. at one time controlled world trade. Not so anymore. We don't have the power that we did in trading. That's shifted away from the U.S., and that's going to continue to. And in every super cycle, there's going to be their share of losers and their winners. You know, if you look at the first super cycle, the loser was agriculture. The winner was industrials. It's going to be not just in industries. It's going to be in companies. It's going to be in companies and industries, advisors and money managers. There's going to be winners and losers as well. Investing is not a zero-sum game. It's not a one-size-fits-all. It's not whom do you like. You know, there have been studies. Fama's study, he shared the Nobel Prize in 1913. His study showed that fewer than 3% of money managers, those professionals that are geared toward outperforming the market, fewer than 3% actually do. But it's an exciting time. You know, in previous programs, I talked about Dow reaching 100,000. I think that I might be even low on saying 100,000. Who would have imagined in 1982 a Dow of 1,000 was going to be 14,000, a 14 fold increase? I think I might be low. I talked about black swan. Black swans happen not just on the negative side, but on the positive side. Talked about the getting through these times, that there were going to be tough times. There were going to be times that we went through corrections. You know, think about that time, 1982 to 1999 or two, early 2000, that time when the Dow went from 1,000 to 14,000, 14 fold increase. Put it in today's perspective, that's a Dow of 140,000. That's the kind of growth that was happening in 1982. And yet, In 1987, we had the biggest one-day drop ever, percentage-wise, in the market. We had a recession in 89. We had problems in 91, 94. It didn't just go up year after year after year. We experienced these, these tough times. And it's going to be a time in which we face a lot of major issues. There was a book that was put out, Friedman and Mandelbaum, talking about that used to be us talking about the issues that we have to overcome in the next few years, talking about the the revolution going on in information technology. It's going to change what goes on. Think about the phone and the changes that have gone on. Think about the, the software and the companies that have come up that way. They're going to create whole new industries Every job is going to become even more complex. You know, that's going to happen. Energy and the environment are going to be big issues. We have climate warming going on, climate weirding going on. We have that change in the climate. And a lot of that is related to increased energy consumption. We need 
that growth to continue. We need to grow energy, but we also have to figure out how to control the climate at the same time. And we have to deal with national debts and deficits. You know, it used to be there was plenty of money that would go around. Now there has to be a prioritized priority. The governments are going to have to put a priority on what they spend money on. They're going to have to put a priority on the regulations and basic research and immigration and modernization of the infrastructure. There's going to ha- what do you do about public education? You know, it's going to be issues that are going to be faced, and yet each of those issues are going to create investment opportunities. You know, if you look at the 20th century, the one that was just complete, when you look at what we came through, we came through the Great Recession, Great Depression, numerous recessions, the 60s, the 80s, the 1900s, and be in between. We came through two world wars, the war to end all wars in 1918, and then we had the Second World War. We came through Vietnam and Korea and multiple worldwide conflicts. We came through the Cold War and the growth of communism and the end of the Cold War. We went through two presidential assassinations in the 20th century. We went through meltdowns like Chernobyl. We went through a multitude of problems and issues, all, almost all unpredictable. And with all those negatives, the Dow began January 1st of 1900 at 66, and it ended December 31st of 1999 at 11,467. Think about that again. The Dow began at 66, and it finished at 11,467. That's a huge growth. And why? Because the 20th century was a positive century. Think about it. We, black swans, are not just on the negative side. We had computers. Who would have thought about a computer? We had automobiles. We developed in medicine, the polio vaccine, biomedical. We increased our average mortality at the beginning of the century was 47 years. Now we're approaching 80 years. The aerospace and travel, walking on the moon, who would have ever guessed at the beginning of the century that was going to take place? A long list of positives, most not predictable. Black swans, that's why the Dow went from 66 to 11,467. I believe that we're in a super cycle. We're in one of the the correction periods. And that correction period for some companies is going to last for a number of years. And I've talked about that. We'll talk a little more about that in the future programs. But I think that that's where we're headed. The Dow went from 66 to 11,467. Now, we're going to repeat a lot of this information on the website. You can log into the website. You can sign up for the e-letter. You can look at the blogs, and the blogs fill out some of this information. You should follow us on Twitter, because as this program's going on, we are sending it out on Twitter. We're sending some of the quotes out on Twitter. The Twitter title is at About Money Radio. Follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. All that is coming. We're coming close to the end of this segment, but I do want to introduce my guest, Ed Weinstein of Weinstein ANU. Welcome to the program, Ed. Thanks, Mike. So why don't we start with your background? Let's make it really a short little thing. Sure. Uh, I'm an architect here in Seattle. I grew up on the coast of Washington in Aberdeen in the 50s and 60s. Came to the University of Washington for my architectural undergraduate degree. Uh, went back to the East Coast to the uh, Graduate School of Design at Harvard in the early 70s. Uh, graduated in 1975 and came back to Seattle to practice. Uh, I've been in Seattle ever since, and I started my own firm in 1977 and seem to have been fortunate to have survived my mistakes. And my firm has grown from just two of us practicing together to a firm of 34 right now. Well, we're going to hear a lot more about it as we go along because we want to get into it, see what you're doing, what what areas of Seattle have changed and why they've changed. Sure, look forward and, to it. You know, you've got that perspective. Mm-hmm. And maybe get some idea of where Seattle is headed in the next decade. Very good. So 
We're coming to a commercial break. Don't go away because we're coming back. I want to pick up after the commercial break and after the interview. You want to hear the rest of the interview. After the interview, we're going to talk about forecasting and how do you evaluate it. Don't go away. We've got a lot more to come. More about money coming up with Mike Adams on Business Radio 1300 KKOL. For more information, click on AdamsFinancialConcepts.com. Creating and maintaining wealth has been the specialty of Adams Financial Concepts for over 20 years. Every portfolio managed by Adams Financial Concepts is customized to fit each particular client's objectives and risk tolerance. The client's interest always comes first in portfolio decisions. Call Mike Adams today at 206-903-1019 or log on to AdamsFinancialConcepts.com to check out their AFC performance. They welcome your review. That's AdamsFinancialConcepts.com. About Money continues. Remember the website, AdamsFinancialConcepts.com. Here's Mike. So I'm here with Ed Weinstein of Weinstein ANU. We just started talking about the the agriculture, the architectural firm. So, Ed, why don't we talk about what you've seen in Seattle happen? Uh, Mike, that's, it's a challenging question. I've uh, been practicing in Seattle for 44 years now. And when I graduated from college in uh, 1971 and started practicing architecture, Seattle was pretty sleepy, and it was very much dependent upon the, the economies of uh, fishing, timber, and airplanes. Um, we went through a number of recessions through the years, and I've never seen a time quite like we're uh, experiencing right now. Um, we, through the years, um, added significant corporations such as Microsoft, Costco, Starbucks, now Amazon. And uh, with each new corporation, we added to the intellectual community in Seattle. And uh, with the, uh, I think, assistance and, and um a sponsorship at the University of Washington, we have been turning out an intellectual community. And uh, I feel all of the growth that we have been um, exposed to recently is really in response to this incredible job creation. And from my perspective, um, and certainly uh, as the owner of an architectural practice, um, I see it uh, on many different marketplaces. I see it in the office development. I see it in the multifamily housing. I see it in the hospitality and generally in the robust business community across town. So as the owner of a generalist architecture firm, uh, I have a vested interest in keeping my eye on the horizon. And I think that it's uh, really strong, and it looks, uh, from my perspective at least, to, to uh, be strong for another four or five years at least. And with this uh, robust job growth and the strong economy come all of the uh, problems associated with densification and growth. Uh, and we see that in the neighborhoods. We see it downtown. We see it with traffic congestion, uh, increased scale of the architecture, all of the things that come with uh, a robust economy and uh, increase in population. So with that kind of a background, now let's talk about your firm. You set right. the stage. Tell us about your firm and what you've done. Well, as I said, my firm is a, a generalist firm. And uh, that's a terrible word uh, for most people. It means that you don't have a primary expertise in anything. Uh, but we like being generalists and working with new communities of clients and learning from them. So we're very involved in uh, five or six different markets. Uh, we do a lot of public sector work, meaning city halls, libraries, and we've been fortunate to have designed all of the city of Seattle's large public safety facilities, the big downtown police station and 911 communication center, the big downtown fire station and emergency operations center and fire alarm center, as well as um, fire stations in the neighborhood. So we have a lot of, uh, I think, a, a high profile in the public sector. We also do a lot of private sector work, which would be um, commercial, uh, retail, uh, and a lot of uh, mixed use and multifamily. So we are presently working on about uh, 10 urban mixed-use projects in uh, the urban villages. Those are typically five stories of housing over one story of commercial, as well as uh, currently working on three residential high-rises. Another market sector that we're very involved in is the adaptive reuse of historic uh, or uh, legacy buildings. 
And we have, uh, we're currently working on three boutique hotels and just completed our own office space uh, at uh, 2200 Western, the Union Stables, which was the adaptive reuse and renovation of uh, uh, 1909 livery stable, uh, <laughs> the large downtown livery stable for the Pipe Place Market. Um, we do hospitality, um, and we do uh, some resort work, and we do a lot of not-for-profits. So um, for the not-for-profits, we've done a number of uh, corporate headquarters for um, the social service organizations and boys and girls clubs, and we do a fair share of affordable and uh, low-income housing, uh, public housing. So I would say that um, we really have our fingers in a lot of different markets, and it's very gratifying to be able to work with different client groups. So why don't we talk about some of the some of the projects you're doing, like the HUD program? Uh, correct. Uh, I mentioned to you that uh, we were the master planners and architects for uh, the Seattle Housing Authority's New Holly Project, which was the uh, total uh, demolition and reconstruction of their Holly Park uh, public housing project on Beacon Hill. And that was a project that uh, we received in uh, the uh, mid-1990s, and the Seattle Housing Authority had received a planning grant from HUD for a mixed-income community. And by mixed income, uh, what I mean is that it's uh, a combination of public housing, uh, uh, assisted hou uh, financially assisted housing for public housing, as well as uh, market rate housing. And the concept that HUD had in the 1990s was that they could stabilize these uh, extremely low-income neighborhoods by providing uh, a certain portion of market rate families in those neighborhoods. So we were responsible for designing the first two phases of New Holly, which was uh, altogether about 850 housing units. Uh, Two-thirds of them were public housing, which were single-family houses, duplex, and townhouses uh, for the public housing recipients. And then uh, a third was the market rate housing. And uh, it was truly wonderful to see the transformation of the neighborhood. These uh, Hope Six projects have a... Um, have been exposed to some criticism because of the perception of the uh, reduction in uh, public housing uh, because uh, some of the uh, densities were reduced and uh, some of the public housing uh, families received Section 8 vouchers that they could use in market rate situations across town. But on the whole, from my perspective at least, I think it was a very good thing and that these uh, neighborhoods are very viable today. And with our success at uh, New Holly, in the late 1990s, the Seattle Housing Authority received other grants for their other communities, um, which are Rainier Vista and High Point. So I think Seattle has a, a, a complement of, of uh, Hope uh, Six communities that's unrivaled anywhere else in the country. And when you look at these these projects and look at what they came from, mm -hmm. most of these projects were high crime areas. They were. They, they were. High were. Um, and I think that uh, that was true across the country. And if you look at the, the uh, legacy of the public housing from the 50s and 60s, it was the ghettoization of low-income people without enough social services and support um, agencies. And uh, they became um, relatively uh, uh, dangerous, uh, a lot of drug use, um, a lot of violence. And I think that was true even here in Seattle uh, in relative terms. Nothing as bad as, as one would find on the East Coast. But that was HUD's notion that by providing home ownership and a diversity of family types that uh, this would promote stabilization, and I think it has worked. It does seem to have worked. Mm -hmm. And you were the... You were the leader on the whole thing. Well, we were. <laughs> I wouldn't say we were the leaders, but we were certainly very intensively involved. So the other thing that's happening, you talked about the multifamily yes. units. And living in West Seattle, we see a lot of those going up. Right. High density. Yes. And you've seen a transformation in Seattle, I would agree. Oh, absolutely. I think all of this follows from the state's uh, growth management and the state, in their wisdom, determined that as growth were to occur, it should happen in the cities where there is the infrastructure and services as opposed to uh, urbanizing rural zones. And I, I think that was wise. So uh, Seattle and the other metropolitan communities in the state were mandated to take a certain increment of, of this growth. And Seattle, in their master planning, looked at the opportunity to 
uh, channel that growth into the uh, key uh, neighborhoods around town that would function as urban villages so that they had better transportation, they had more services, uh, and they had a, a pre-existing a higher density of zoning. So um, that has uh, certainly played out over the last um, 10 or 15 years, but uh, nowhere near uh, as quickly as it has over the last two or three. As I say, that this job creation that has been certainly unprecedented in my experience has promoted the acceleration of development in ways that uh, never could have been anticipated. And uh, if you had asked me in 2008, just at the start of the Great Recession, if we were going to ever build another apartment building or an <laughs> office tower or a hotel, I would have been very skeptical. It turns out that um, the recession was clarifying, but uh, the job growth was overwhelming. And by the time we started getting into 2013, 2014, and certainly this year, uh, the uh, the brakes were off and developers were interested in building as quickly as possible to try to come up uh, or catch up with the latent demand for housing. And I don't see that subsiding for another four or five years. I mean, a lot of people might be skeptical that we can continue to fill these apartments, but, but my belief is that the as long as the jobs are being created, the developers will be uh, interested in providing the housing to accommodate and most of these new jobs that we're seeing here in Seattle are focused on uh, the downtown South Lake Union, Pioneer Square, Ballard, uh, areas where people want to live. So I don't think that that trend is going to subside. And uh, I think the challenge for all of us, especially the city planners and developers and architects, is to try to find a way to do it as humanely and reasonably as possible. So transportation is a big part of that, uh, the open space, the infrastructure. But I, I find it to be a very exciting time, and I'm happy to be practicing right now. It is an exciting yeah. time. And the expansion, you know, I've driven around South Lake Union in the last couple of years, I don't recognize what it is. It's just... Well, I, I think you're absolutely right. And uh, if you don't pay attention, uh, neighborhoods can change within a year. And if you take a different route home, all of a sudden you see buildings that you had never seen before. So I, I think that... Uh, that is the exciting part of it, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't emphasize that we also, as architects and urbanists, we have a responsibility to improve the environment as we build. And I would be a critical of my breed and say that we can always do a better job with these buildings. That's great. Thanks for being on the program, Matt. You're welcome. Very, very informative. Very interesting to know what's going on in Seattle. And to the listener, don't go away. Don't touch the dial. We've got to finish this up. We've got okay. more about money to be coming right up. Stay tuned. About Money returns in a moment with Mike Adams here on Business Radio 1300 KKOL. For more information, click on AdamsFinancialConcepts.com. Lots of people manage investment portfolios. Just a few can manage a successful portfolio and provide exceedingly great service to their clients. Here's Mike Adams from Adams Financial Concepts. We believe the price you pay should be based on the performance of your portfolio and the quality of service you receive. You know, Mike, it seems that a lot of companies subscribe to the one-size-fits-all mentality of investing. Does one size really fit all? Not with us. Every portfolio that we manage is customized to fit each particular client's objectives and risk tolerance. We place our clients' interests first in all portfolio decisions. If you're looking for a home for your seven-figure-plus investment portfolio, call Mike Adams of Adams Financial Concepts, specializing in creating and maintaining wealth for over 20 years. 206-903-1019. That's 206-903-1019. Or log on to adamsfinancialconcepts.com. We're back with more about money. For details on what you hear on today's show, visit adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Now, here again is Mike Adams. So my guest today on the program has been Ed Weinstein of Weinstein ANU. Before he leaves today, I want him to tell you how you can get a hold of him if you have a project. You heard his background. You heard about his firm growing from 2 to 32 people. He's done a wonderful job. So, Ed... If somebody wants to get a hold of you, how would they do that? Uh, thanks, Mike. Probably the easiest way, frankly, is by email. And my email address is uh, edw at weinsteinau.com. So that's edw at 
W-E-I-N-S-T-E-I-N-A-U.com. That's great. Thanks for being on the program. You're welcome. Thank you. So I want to shift gears and talk a little bit about Philip Tetlock, and he is probably the top expert on forecasting and lining up who are super forecasters and how is forecasting done. He was a psychology and political science major when he was at Berkeley in 1987, and he set up a project which has gained some notoriety because he took a broad array of experts and he asked them to predict some very major events. What was going to happen with the USSR? What was going to happen in the Gulf War? What was going to happen with the Japanese real estate bubble? What was going to happen in Quebec? Other major things. And he wrote a conclusion after he gathered all the information from all the experts predicting things. He found that the expert political judgment was not any better than random chance. That most experts were grossly overconfident. That 15% of the events they said had absolutely no possible chance of ever happening. 15% of those actually did happen. 25 things that they said, you could go to the bank, you could count on it, you could you could make a huge bet it was going to happen. 25% of those sure things failed. It was economics, it was politics, it was international affairs. You know, those were the things that ex- experts were predicting. And so he's taken that time to look and do studies, and he's written a new book called Super Forecasting. And... I wanted to bring home what's going on because what I've been talking about, this super cycle is actually a forecast, is looking into the future. What's happening on a larger scale? Worldwide growth in GDP. Is it valid? Is it not valid? The one thing that Tetlock does say is very often people never look back to see if what was predicted actually did happen. People don't look at the accuracy of forecast. They only look at the forecast itself and if it makes reasonable sense. I mentioned the the BRIC thesis. Brazil, Russia, India, and China. It was something that was came out of Goldman Sachs in the early part of this century. They said that in those four countries that the GDP was going to grow faster and that was going to be great for their stock markets. But it was really based on very limited information. It sounded reasonable. It sounded logical. When you thought about it at the time, it seemed like it was really a solid forecast and it seemed like that was a place to invest money. Now, I never did that. I have to say, I never did that. I didn't really believe it in the first place, but that's another subject. But that information was based on just 10 years of data for Brazil and Mexico. Think about it. Only 10 years worth of data for Brazil and Mexico. That built this whole concept of Brazil, Russia, India, and China. There was data that was available that was actually more accurate and contradictory. And if you look at the United States Over the last 40 years, there's actually a negative correlation, a negative relationship between stock market returns and GDP. And think about what people have talked about just since the end of the Great Recession. 2009 to current times, GDP, you hear it, you hear it in the debates, you hear it going on TV, in the newspapers, on magazines. You hear about the slow growth in the United States. But yet, what's happened in the stock market? We haven't seen a slow growth in the stock market. We've seen the stock market go from a little over 6,600 to 17,000. That's that's almost a triple. And yet, the the economy is squeaking along at 1.5% or 2% per year. It was the same in the 1980s, by the way. In the 1980s, the accusation was... The stock market wasn't going to do well because we had slow growth, slow GDP growth. You know, you know what happened in the 1980s and 90s. GDP continued to be a slow growth and the stock market went from 1,000 to 14,000. 
You know, Credit Suisse did a study a couple years ago looking at 83, com 83 countries from 1972 to 2009, and they ranked them by GDP growth for periods of the preceding five years. Investing in the stock market of the highest growth companies, growth countries, would have yielded 18.4% return. But investing in the lowest growth co countries would have yielded 25.1. So in the low growth, 25.1. In the high growth, 18.4. Not the kind of correlation that you would expect. Not what was expected with BRIC. You know, those are the kind of things that we have to live with. And that brings me to another prediction that was made by Larry Kudlow. CNBC. You've heard Larry Kudlow, an economist. He was an economist in the Reagan administration, largely responsible for the concept of supply-side economics. George W. Bush chose that concept, the supply-side economics, and made substantial tax cuts. That was based on what Kudlow thought. And Kudlow, Kudlow because of those tax cuts, expected a huge boom. He called it the Bush boom. He expected that was going to happen. Big tax cuts, the economy was going to soar. You know, actually, after they made the tax cuts, the economy continued to move along, but it was kind of disappointing. And very, dis very, very disappointing when you compared it to the tax increase under Bill Clinton and the growth under Clinton. But large ideas seem to get fixed by their authors. That's why I worry about this super cycle thing. I think I'm right, but I look at Kudlow, and Kudlow held firm to his prediction. In December of 2007, as the Great Recession was really taking shape, he said, there's not going to be a recession. In fact, we're going to enter the seventh year of the Bush boom. December 2007, you can look it up. From 2007 to 2009, Kudlow did not budge. He expected that Bush boom. In fact, he said on CNBC, we are in a mental recession. It's not actual recession. We're in a mental recession. And he continued to say that until Lehman Brothers went down. It's not uncommon. So I am concerned. I believe that the super cycle is valid, that we're in a period of time where we're seeing a correction but th that there's still investments to be made and a lot of money to be made over the next five to 15 years. I think we're seeing that all unfold. It's not uncommon to have a big idea, but it's also something that you look at and that I look at as time goes along to see if I might be wrong. Harry Truman was the one that said, I wish I could find some one-handed economist. I remember that? Or maybe you don't remember? One-handed economist. Why one-handed economist? Because most economists said, this is my prediction, but on the other hand. And with that thought, have a very good, great weekend. I don't want to make this the other hand. You've been listening to About Money with Mike Adams a registered investment advisor. If you'd like more information about what you heard today or about Mike's investment philosophy and strategy, or if you want Mike to evaluate your own portfolio, click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com. That's adamsfinancialconcepts.com. The information shared on the preceding program was for educational purposes only. and Any investment advice given may not be suitable for all investors. Join us again next Friday afternoon at 3 for more About Money with Mike Adams here on Business Radio 1300 KKOL. The preceding program was sponsored by Adams Financial Concepts. Creating and maintaining wealth has been the specialty of Adams Financial Concepts for over 20 years. Every portfolio managed by Adams Financial Concepts is customized to fit each particular client's objectives and risk tolerance. 
The client's interest always comes first in portfolio decisions. Call Mike Adams today at 206-903-1019 or log on to AdamsFinancialConcepts.com to check out their AFC performance. They welcome your review. That's AdamsFinancialConcepts.com. The following program.